All right, welcome to the Praxis Behind the Obscure podcast. And today I have a special guest who is an occultist and also a fiction author who sort of uh, ties in or uh, ties in occult themes into his writing. So I thought it'd be very good to have him on the podcast. And uh, there's some uh, books coming out soon as well. So it's a pretty good, good timing to have you on, right? So can you, uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience and how you got into esoteric and occult practices? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really nice to do. And uh, yeah, let's see. I I, um, uh, I got into occult practices at about age 20. Um, it just kind of flipped on like a light switch. I'd never really been that into occultism before. I kind of vaguely, barely even knew what it was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a girlfriend who had an ex-boyfriend that was really into Aleister Crowley, and she just like hated anything else you could possibly imagine. Like she would misquote the book of the law all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so around the age 20, it, yeah, just, uh, I, I got into it through, um, partly through kind of psychedelic use and partly through just noticing that like some of the records I collected had things like runes on them and, and kind of referred to um, vaguely occult topics. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up picking up a book by Nigel Pennock called Magical Alphabets. Um, it had some stuff on runes and uh, the Hebrew alphabet and the Greek alphabet. Uh, I think the Ugham alphabet and Gnosticism. And um, the idea that you could have an alphabet where every letter in that alphabet had a meaning and a function and the meaning had a tremendous amount of depth to it. Um, archetypal. I was vaguely aware of what archetypes were at the time. Uh, that, that just completely resonated with me. And I very quickly went... Um, from that to uh, getting into Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn and Chaos Magic, and it would just kind of snowball. Mm -hmm. um, and after about six months of just diving into this stuff um, and doing, you know, many, many psychedelic substances, uh, which kind <laughs> of the whole thing, um, uh, I started practicing. It, just, it became really evident, you know, what what types of practice would would be the uh, the best things to start with. So I just started with some, you know, some banishing rituals and. Mm -hmm magic stuff and meditations. Um, I would sit down in a painfully awkward meditation uh, position <laughs> half an hour to an hour a day. I kind of went up to like an hour and a half. Right. Um, and I kind of gradually stopped doing the psychedelic so much just because I wanted to focus on, on occultism. Mm -hmm. so anyway, um, six months of rigorous practice. This is also the period of my life where I realized that self-discipline was extremely important to me. Mm. Because as soon as I got into this stuff, I kind of knew that I'd be doing it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just going to be this lifelong obsession. And I knew that I'd never really be able to do it unless I had the discipline to really do it every day and, and uh, really do the practices very rigorously. Mm. Okay, so, so you, you uh, uh, okay, that's pretty interesting. So you, uh, psychedelics, as with a lot of people that I interviewed, and also including myself, psychedelics have been like a big gateway into the esoteric and the occult, right? And um, yeah, when they say it's a gateway drug, they have no idea what they're really <laughs> talking about. Yeah, exactly. So how about currently? Are you still, do you still every now and then use psychedelics? Or is it sort of like, it got me in and now I'm sort of, you sort of like a boat that, cross, you know, allowed you to cross the river, but you kind of moved on from it? Well, it's a very occasional thing. Um, I don't do them very often, but I do kind of keep them in, in, in semi-regular use. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is just, it's, um, so, you know, with esoteric practice, um, you know, in some ways with esoteric practice, you're just dropping a series of, of depth charges into your unconscious and shaking mm -hmm. things. But at the same time, there's also a very much a direction and a fine level of control and, um, uh, mm -hmm. Whereas with psychedelics, you're kind of hitting the random switch. You just have no idea. <laughs> right. Uh, it's not something that, that's really controlled. It's always a surprise. Mm -hmm. It takes you to kind of new places. Um, there's, there's a certain amount that psychedelic use has in, in common with occult practice, and there's a certain amount that it's just completely different. Mm. Um, uh, so I kind of I do it every once in a while just for the, the places in which the two things don't really have common ground. Um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's nice just to drop a little random bomb in your brain and just see what comes <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost always really fortuitous. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a, it's still a kind of useful tool, but it's kind of like Huxley at one point. Um, I think he started doing a psychedelic substance like once a year or something and, and, uh, that was good enough, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. It is also kind of cool to have that little, uh, like you mentioned, it's sort of um, the, the fact that with esoteric practices, like you have some sort of direction or some sort of build up, you know, some sort of current that you're moving in. Whereas the psychedelics, it's, it's sort of like being in a, um, sort of like a, in a, uh, what do they call that? When you go rafting, when you have like the rapids or whatever, right? You, you don't really know yeah. if you're going to go left or right or down a waterfall or whatever, right? But that element of randomness definitely, you know, can put you in a vulnerable space and sort of, you know, allow you to see things from a different angle or at least, you um, at least put you in a different space that you wouldn't have been previous to the experience, right? So, yeah, yeah it can, which can be valuable in itself, right? Yeah, yeah, it really can. It's different, you know. There's just, um, yeah, it's just a different, a different approach coming at it from a very slightly different angle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, also your so your pin name is Damian Murphy. Is that your actual name too, or is that just? Oh, yeah. Your... Okay, cool. Yeah, I realized in the beginning of the podcast I introduced you as writer and occultist, but I didn't mention your name, which is uh, Damian Murphy for anybody out there. Um, and later yeah. on, we can get into your writing and sort of like how people can um, can find your books and whatnot, right? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so you mentioned that, you know, you got into occultism and then we, we chatted on Facebook a little bit and you mentioned that you were part of a Golden Dawn Temple in the Washington area, right? You, you yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I always like to call it a heretical Golden Dawn Temple, but... <laughs> Oh, okay. That sounds even more interesting, actually. So how did you, like, uh, how did you find this? Or, like, how did you, you know, because a lot of people, they might read a book on occultism or whatnot and do some meditation, as you mentioned, but how did you sort of, like, what what was it that, you know, triggered you to, like, full-fledged join this sort of, like, Golden Dawn Order? And, uh, you know, how did you find it and whatnot? I'm curious about all well, that. Well, it happened really organically. Um, I'd been assiduously practicing for about six months, and I met a guy that was part of the temple, Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he was older than me. He was like in his 40s, uh, and he would complain about the teacher all the time, just constantly. <laughs> um, but he also started giving me some, like, the material um, for each of the grades uh, of the temple, and, and this guy, he was really on it, kind of, uh, as far as occult go, occultism goes, really smart, and uh, it was really clear he knew what he was doing. Um, he was one of the funniest people I've ever met to this mm -hmm. day, and uh, you know, we, we became friends and he started just kind of funneling this, his teacher's material to me, which of course she would have totally objected to. Mm. Uh, kind of mentoring me a little bit in doing it. So I went from doing just basic occult practices um, uh, to doing um, kind of a more structured, uh, immersive, kind of intensive uh, training system. Mm -hmm. Just using this material and a little bit of this guy's guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and it got to a point after about a year of doing that, I was going up through the different levels of the, the training. Uh, things started getting weird. I started having like kind of serious Kundalini experiences and mm -hmm. really weird feelings in my body. And uh, a lot of the material at that level had to do with moving forces around the body, elemental forces and planetary forces and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'd have weird things happen. I remember doing a middle pillar one time and uh, in a really specific way. When it got to my neck, uh, I just heard a <coughs> was like a electrical pop or something. And I realized mm. in my body and I was like, what the hell's going on? And I kind of mm. felt I'm doing, I don't really know what I'm doing. And it felt like it could be kind of dangerous. Mm. Uh, the guy that was mentoring me, I just didn't feel like he, he really knew enough of how it all works. So around that point, I started getting a little bit, uh, not really paranoid, but just kind of, kind of edgy about the whole thing. Um, mm. It was right around that time when he took me to meet his teacher, uh, his teachers, who was a woman and uh, her husband. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this, um, so the teacher, this was actually part of a, like you were learning through your friend and he was sort of giving yeah. you the um, the instructions or the sort of rituals and whatnot, right? But uh, mm -hmm. like he, that guy was actually a part of a, like a temple. Oh in yeah. Washington, right? Yeah, he I was see. a long standing member. And he's okay. like, don't. Mm -hmm. Don't tell my teacher that I'm giving her stuff. <laughs> <She'll be right. laughs> uh -huh. And um, uh -huh. I didn't think I'd like her because I'd, I'd listened to him complain about her for so long. But okay. uh, we got really well. Um, I, it was really clear to me immediately that both her and her husband really knew what they were doing. Mm. Uh, I ended up going to a weekend retreat, uh, got initiated into their temple, and then decided um, I'm just going to start all the way over at ground zero. Mm. Um, I, I never... I, I did tell her eventually what had happened, like that I'd had her teachings, you know, given to me by this other guy, but I didn't tell her until like after I'd 
gone through her whole teaching and was already not in the temple anymore. <laughs> ah, interesting. Okay. Hmm. And uh, she was like, interesting. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just knew that the teaching I would get would be a lot better and, and a lot more comprehensive. Um, and uh, it, I would just be able to go a lot deeper with it. So uh, I just decided to just, you know, start from scratch and, and go through it officially and uh, join the temple. Okay, no, that sounds interesting. So what about now? Like, I think that, you know, we've been chatting on Facebook. I think that you had mentioned that you kind of have your own, you're not, you're not currently in that same temple, right? No, they dissolved. Uh, I was, mm -hmm. I was their last student. Oh, interesting. Just out of curiosity, do they have like some sort of, you know, like, like lineage or are they part of some sort of like, uh, I, I don't know that much about this. I know there's all these different Golden Dawn lineages. Did they have like their own sort of? Um, uh, uh, kind of. Um, they were friends with Pat Zalaski. Uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the guy um, is from New Zealand and the way he pronounces his own name is, is Zalaski. So that was how I always heard it. Um, mm -hmm. And they had done a lot of work with him. Um, when they first started their temple. And uh, I, I guess, yeah, they, they probably did the whole like passing of the link thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, the, the people that were my teachers, the temple, by the way, was called the Raharakti Temple of the Golden Dawn. Mm -hmm. They never put that much stock in trade and lineage. They would really downplay the whole idea. Uh, I really do too. It's never really meant anything to me. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, good. But yeah, they did have, and they were kind of plugged into um, to the temple in New Zealand. Uh, just, you know, they, they did a lot of work. They did initiations with them and everything. Mm. Okay. So after this temple dissolved, you sort of, um, you, you, did you decide that you kind of wanted to run your sort of own, own informal school or informal um, kind of like training system or something like that? Yeah, um, I kind of know I wanted to do that for a long time. Uh, I did a little bit of what my friend did. I didn't, I didn't funnel my teachers, you know, material anybody else, but... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, new people would come in and if I was friends with them, I would teach them stuff, you know, and, um, my teacher would find out and say like, okay, stop doing that. I'm going to take over from here. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I just knew I, I always wanted to teach people. It just was something that always came naturally to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, after the temple closed, um, I, I went a couple years, you know, and, and then just stood just kind of, again, it just really organically happened. I just ended up kind of in the right place at the right time, students started showing up. I got involved with another temple that was just doing the initiations. Mm -hmm. uh, the temple was connected with the open source order of the Golden Dawn uh, down mm -hmm. in California. But again, it was like a, it was like a heretical version of the open source order, if that makes any sense. Yeah. A version of a heretical version of the Golden Dawn. <laughs> I like, like that. The people in the open source order were getting mad at us because we weren't doing it the way they said we should. Actually, right. honestly, <laughs> and I, and I don't want to. I don't want to like talk bad about that group because I have an immense amount of respect for right, that, right. for the Golden Dawn and like everybody in it. It's just the work they did is just enormous and fantastic. Right, but, uh, right. but I mean, we were. Doing, <laughs> you know, you're pushing the boundaries like, when it's you, not really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you when you're when you're uh, when you're pissing off the open order. <laughs> open. Yeah. Source I don't know if we were yeah. pissing them off, but I mean, they were. You know, they were definitely saying, "Well, that wasn't really exactly what we had in mind." Mm, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that got me started uh, doing the initiations. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. already been trying to do them um, with the other temple. But, you know, by the time I joined um, the first temple I was part of, there were really only a few people that came in after that point for initiation. So I didn't get a lot of chance to, uh, to really learn how to do those initiations. Mm. Um, anyway, being part of this other order, uh, I got really conversant with the initiations. And then I started my own temple. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we use the same initiations. Uh, as far as the temple structure goes, I, I've, I've kind of retained the same structure that my teachers used, which is, mm -hmm. the reason I say it was heretical is because they, they moved the entire inner order pretty much into the outer order. Mm, okay. And got people started in, in really immersive occult work, you know, really right from the beginning. Mm. Um, and just changed the whole structure around and, and did a lot of stuff um, that was that, just really different in the way. We just had Golden Dawn groups do it. And that's pretty frowned upon too, right? Like uh, having those um, inner order teachings to the outer order. And like, it's not like in traditional, the sort of like, you know, traditional formalities and dogma. It doesn't really allow for that, right? Typically. Yeah, it's, I've talked to a lot of people in other Golden Dawn groups and uh, people that run other golden dawn groups mm -hmm. 
Um, it's frowned upon. Yeah. I mean, I definitely find that nobody's ever accused me of, you know, being, you know, bad or heretical or anything. Everybody's in the Golden Dawn community that I've ever interacted with has been just really friendly and, and really, really helpful. But, um, but yeah, about it. there's the idea that, um, and I don't think this is true at all. There's kind of the idea that um, magic work and occult work is really dangerous and that uh, the initiations make it less dangerous and they somehow make it uh, um, possible to do, you know, or it, it just wouldn't be safe to do without them. Right. right. Uh, and I, I absolutely do not think that's true. Um, in the original Golden Dawn group I was in, we only ever did the neophyte initiation. We didn't do the elemental initiations. Mm. Uh, and there were a number of reasons behind that, but uh, I know a ton of people that are that are self-taught. They just kind of dove into occultism. They didn't do any of the initiations, mm -hmm. uh, and you know they didn't turn themselves. You know, the lightning didn't come and strike them. They didn't turn themselves into a pile of ash. Uh, right. <laughs> right. That uh, have gone in through a temple and have gone through the initiations. That have, you know, that have done things maybe carelessly and and have had um, unfortunate things happen. I mean. Mm -hmm. Cult work certainly can be dangerous. I think anything that's worth anything can be dangerous. Sure. Couldn't be dangerous. It'd be like, well, what good is it then? You know, it'd be like mm -hmm. if drugs could be dangerous. Well, I don't know. Right. Right. Um, but I, I really don't think that the initiations, um, I have a, a, a huge body of ideas as to what these initiations actually do. Mm -hmm. But making it so that a cult work is, is suddenly safe to do is really not one of them, in my opinion. Right. It seems like that's an issue with these sort of like formal orders and whatnot. Like you talked about, we talked about earlier, like this, these, all these arguments on lineage and you have to go through these initiations. It's sort of like, uh, it feels like kind of like in religion in a sense where it can get bogged down in like the letter of the law, right? Like yeah. it's not, instead of understanding the actual reason or intention or um, purpose behind why things are structured in a way, it's sort of getting caught up in the structure itself, right? Right. And the, uh, the people that were my teachers um, were way, and they, they used structure, but um, they made ample use of class. Um, mm. My teacher, uh, uh, her name is Laura York, by the way, Laura, Laura Jennings, Laura Jennings York, or your, Laura York, depending on what era of, of her teaching uh, you got involved with her, her work in. Um, she coined the, term, uh, coined the term kamikaze magic. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I really like to throw people into into the fire, you know, and, and just mm -hmm. them struggle and see if they survived. And, you know, if they didn't, if everything fell apart, she would she would um, kind of catch them, you know. There were a right. number of us. I, I worked with her for about five years and lived with her for two years. Mm -hmm. There were a number of people whose lives just um, totally fell apart at some point. And she's like, well, okay, if you want to live here, you know, you've got a space. And uh, she charged really cheap rent. Mm -hmm. Um the caveat being that she would mercilessly mess with you uh, <laughs> the entire funny. time you lived there. I mean, she, she had a very strong um, Gurdjieff influence. Um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Gurdjieff would often do that. And, you know, the, the work um, in that temple, it was not only just kind of Golden Dawn occult work, but it was also very mm -hmm. intense psychological work. Okay, that's interesting. So all kinds especially of Especially if you live there, yeah. It was super oh. intense. You know, it was, it was like living in the fire pit. Okay, that's a trip. You said you, you lived there as well? Did you mention that? Yeah, yeah, I lived there for a couple of years. Um, okay. And uh, when I moved in, I was just like, I don't know what I'm getting myself involved in. This is like going to be some kind of crazy cult or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it turned out to be kind of not like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, just because it's, I mean, it was just such an intense environment. Mm. I saw people that had lived there before have a, a really hard time. Um, and I didn't really have quite as hard of a time, although I definitely wouldn't call it easy. Mm. Um, but then I was also very primed to uh, to expect exactly kind of what I got and and the kind of things they did. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, it's an interesting background. So currently, um, do you, are you still running this uh, like small kind of study group? Like you mentioned that uh, like your current the current way that you were talking about it was like it's sort of more like the AA like a sort of like a mentor to student style of mm -hmm. uh, teaching, right? Are you still a uh, part of this or do you still have like students that are yeah. coming over? No, I okay. still do it, yeah. Okay, that's great. So what's, um, I'm very curious, like, are you using, is it kind of like using what you learned from the Golden Dawn and sort of um, bringing that into like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship? 
in a way, in a way, kind of like how you initially got into this, like uh, how you mentioned you had that friend who gave you, you know, he was kind of like siphoning off the teaching. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, kind of. It's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. there's a there's a very specific structure to the teaching. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I did is uh, my teacher um, kind of developed this teaching up to a certain point. Um, uh, she moved the inner order into the outer order. And uh, once you got to the end of the outer order, there really wasn't anything after that. You just kind of worked with her in the, what she called the inner order temple. And what that was is you just did whatever, whatever her and her husband were doing. Usually Enochian stuff is what they mostly did. Mm, okay. And you met every week, you know, and most students uh, got into that before they got out of the outer order. Uh, that's what happened with me too. Um, so I kind of took their teaching and developed it a little further and added a little more. Um, just kind of, you know, uh, a couple of extra grades um, to take it a little further. And I, I basically use their exact same structure. And um, yeah, it's all one-on-one -on -one teaching. Um, mm -hmm. I make it as undogmatic as possible. Uh, I try to look at it kind of as if I'm teaching like a martial art or if I was teaching like a musical instrument or something. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I absolutely don't do, uh, my teachers did this a little bit, but not so much as sketchy, but I, I never do the like, you know, like the, the wise teacher thing. Like, I'm not like, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, these are the grades. This is the work you have to do in the grades. This is basically what it'll do. And then there's always other stuff that it's gonna do that you can't predict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you do this work and you pass this test, you go on to the next grade, no questions asked. There's never like any kind of, um, you know, like, oh, you'll go <laughs> when to you're, when you're spiritually advanced enough or anything like that. It's like, you do this work, you're going to be ready for the next grade. That's, that's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't think it's possible to, with the, with the structure that uh, I'm using, to do the work in any particular grade and not be ready to go on to the next grade. Mm. And I found that to be really true in practice. If, if somebody isn't ready to go on, they won't be able to finish the work. It's just that simple. Right, um, right, right. You, you, give, it, the, you, know? you give the students the kind of freedom to explore that and see, sort of check themselves, right? Like, like you said, Kinda, it's yeah. like... Yeah, it's like if they do something that they're not ready for, they're going to sort of realize it themselves or maybe have a question for you and sort of have to go back and maybe develop more of a uh, solid foundation, right? Kind of like it with the the um, martial arts analogy, you say like, it's kind of like say you roll with like a black belt or a brown belt in jujitsu mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you're a blue belt. You're, you're going to know. I mean, it's not like, it's very clear yeah. that, you know, the, you know, you still have a lot of the um, foundational drills and foundational, you know, positions and whatnot that you have to... Um, really develop a lot more right over time you know yeah and i mean i've gone through the whole system myself i've seen a ton of people go through it both under my teacher guidance and under my teaching mm -hmm. and i'm really familiar with what happens at the different stages mm -hmm. see i would have I mean, if somebody were were like yeah i'm doing the ritual sure i am <laughs> it'd be it'd be really obvious mm. have you seen uh because i'm sure by now you've had like a lot of these students and people that have come up through it um have you been surprised or um, like, but has there been new areas that like students have explored that sort of, I'm sure that you've learned from the students as well, right? Has there been anything oh, totally, like they, yeah. they explored this whole different area that you never explored and sort of the student becomes the teacher in a way, right? Has that happened quite a bit? Kind of. I mean, there definitely are students that have done things that I never would have thought of um, mm. that are just amazing. Um, uh, I had a student that made a series of Shemem Forash cubes. Like, oh, wow. And each side has a... Um, each one is dedicated to one zodiacal sign. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they're all done in the flashing colors and everything, so they just look amazing. And uh, each side had one Shemem Forish angel sigil on it. And uh -huh. she consecrated each one. And I think she even had like a series of like, this was a, several years ago, had a series of like alchemical wine she made with each one. Oh, wow. That's a, that sounds oh, awesome. I've never heard of anybody doing stuff like that. Uh, what, what were the cubes made out of? I'm curious. Like, uh, oh, what, just what wood. Sort of like oh, wow. Wood. Okay. That's a trip. Wow. Oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. Every student also like hits the different points a little bit differently and just reveals different things about um, the whole structure that I'm using, which in turn kind of reveals more general stuff about the work. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Teaching somebody is one of the best ways to learn. You also learn about your own your own responses, your own limitations. You you very quickly learn what you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You have to you have to know it very quickly. Um, right. And, uh, I'm sure there's been areas. Learn, 
there's been probably times where you have to say I don't know as well, right? Absolutely. Like student, what I was just gonna say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of teachers can, like, sort of bullshit. That, uh, like, yeah, pretend like they know, but uh, it, it is it is nice when you have a teacher that says. I've always respected teachers that I've had in my life. You know, whatever area it is, where I ask them a question, they say they don't know. You know, it's like wow, yeah. this is a this is a real person that I'm talking to. That you know. Admits I've known a couple of know. teachers that got really trapped in the opposite, where they they haven't been able to say it. They they um, get trapped in the psychology of always having to know more than the student and always having to be right. And it's like, man, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> it's right. To say, oh, I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll uh, we could research it or try it or something. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, you know, what, what currently, what sort of practices do you do? I know that. Um, uh, you kind of mentioned to me that you sort of have some sort of like regular workings that you're a part of. Um, what what defines your current practice and why why do you do these practices? Uh, well, there's kind of a bunch of different things. Um, I kind of have a continual kind of feedback loop going with uh, with like the deities and spirits that I work with on a really regular basis. Uh, but that said, there's, there's a, a number of kind of mainstays. Um, I've gone a little bit I still utilize a lot of the Golden Dawn material, but uh, I've adapted a lot of other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Stuff from like the Greek magical papyri and mm -hmm. uh, other, other kind of similar sources. Um, for the last probably, I guess it's been like 20 years now, mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest mainstay ritual that I have is the Bornless Rite, which is more correctly the, the Rite of the Headless One. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I've, created like different versions of the ritual and different ritual redactions of it. And um, I've just, I found it to be an incredibly versatile ritual. Mm. Uh, and it's also just, it's a, it's a great, it's general purpose enough to kind of have, be able to serve me, even though what I'm really doing with the work has changed quite a bit over the years. This one ritual has been able to, to continue. It's like the, the ritual that just keeps giving, you know? <laughs> mm, you, so basically you keep kind of expanding. Stop using this, yeah, you keep yeah, you keep uh, expanding on uh, on that specific ritual basically and deepening it. Yeah, and that's I mean that's so that's that's one that I I've just done regularly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. once a week, uh, sometimes more um, for a, a really really long time. Right. Have you ever read? Um, I mentioned this in a, another podcast, but uh, a book called Ceremonial Magic by Israel Regardi. Have you read that book? Oh yeah yeah. That's yeah, that's, such a, uh, yeah, the Watchtower was another one that I, I used to do a lot. Not quite as much now, but uh -huh. one of my teachers big, you know, the, we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like about that book is it literally, it's like 100 pages or I don't know, 120 pages or something, but it literally only goes over two rituals, right? Which are the Watchtower and the Bornless or the Headless, right? And uh, it just shows how like, I like how he shows that sort of, you know, the, the fundamental praxis and um, like reason you're doing this and then how you can just sort of shows how you can just keep deepening it and deepening it like it starts out very simple right sort of just understanding oh, yeah. the fundamentals and then it's like by the end of it it's like whoa you know it's like you know this like very intense very um like each section or each part of it just becomes even that much more expansive and how you know it's sort of like you're talking about the martial arts analogy right like you, you kind of start out with like the beginning of each ritual kind of starts out with the fundamentals of like you know, I don't know how familiar you are with like jujitsu or anything like that, but it's like uh, not really. You know, okay, but you just you know some the basic super fundamentals, and then you get into just all the little side details that you can add to create oh, yeah. that much more of a deeper experience, right? So it sounds like that's kind of what you're doing with the um, the headless right or the bornless right. Kind of one of the nice things too is that in recent years, just in the last two decades, mm -hmm. uh, there's just been a lot more. Um, kind of scholarly work done around that, right? Uh, and the, the Greek magical papyri in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I started doing it, it was just this thing that a couple people in the Golden Dawn had become interested in. And, you know, I didn't know that much about it. I just wanted to do it and, and um, I just took right to it. It became my, my mainstay, but I didn't really know what most names meant or didn't really know a lot of the background. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, I've just learned more and more and more about um, kind of what a range of, of possible backgrounds to it and, and just uh, gotten way more in depth as to what um, what it kind of originally meant, what it was kind of originally used for and originally signified. There's been a lot of interesting speculation as to just exactly who the bornless one is or the headless one is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you read uh, that? And that's kind of, 
the, okay. uh, the the headless one by Jake Stratton Kent. Oh yeah, that's 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 a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, I like it because it kind of goes into like how Crow Crowley used it with the um, with Lieber Samick, and then also sort of back into the PGM, um, sort of the origins in the PGM and how you know it may have been used there, right? Like people talk about it as like an exorcism or. Um, there's all there's all kinds of speculation, right, on the origins of it. Yeah, and um, it's interesting that Jake Stratton Kemp's work with it. He hit upon a couple of things that um, a lot of the times these you know these the way these things work is it's just super fortuitous. It just all these things kind of come together at once. Mm -hmm. um, so um, a lot of of uh, Stratton Kemp's ideas about it uh, just tied in perfectly with other things that I was exploring at the time, and everything just kind of perfectly you know came together on a number of occasions with this right. Mm. Um, yeah and so it's often the way it happens um so there's that and then there's um i just do a bunch of other stuff a lot of visionary work um mm -hmm. projecting into things like tarot cards and tatwas and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that um there are a lot of uh, things you can do to induce vision uh, i do a lot of um invocations of deity mm -hmm. uh, both in the golden dawn sense and in the the kind of older um uh, sense the, the, the you know a lot of work you'd, you'd see in the Greek magical papyri mm -hmm. uh, of conjuration evocation of spirits um, there's a uh, before the pandemic I was doing uh, once a month I was doing a Eucharist ritual it was kind of semi-public it was um, not entirely open to the public but people were uh, allowed to like invite other people and stuff and we always had this kind of continually we had a little core group and then a continually shifting group of uh, people that would kind of come and go, but these were uh, Eucharist rituals, um, Zodiac oh, wow. rituals. Uh, I still do them now, but now it's just me and my partner and we're waiting for the pandemic to end so we can start the group work again. You said these were semi-public, like in what context? Well, that? just like, that like, people you... could, <laughs> I'm people just could bring guests, you know? They're, they're oh, not okay. really public, I wouldn't let just anybody, I mean, they're in my house, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, because when you said that, I was imagining you in a park and like people watching. <laughs> <laughs> not nearly that public, no. <laughs> yeah, not, um, that, not that public, yeah. You know, but people could could bring guests, you know, and, and everything. They use discretion and common sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, so what we do is we'll just, uh, we'll have a zodiacal sign that we're invoking. Um, it's generally the sign that the sun is going into uh, at the time we do it. Um, we'll invoke the uh, god of the sign, charge up a bottle of wine uh, with the invoked, and then call forth the uh, spirits, the zodiacal spirits, mm -hmm. um, drink some of the wine and commune. And... Uh, I've been doing that for about five, six years now. It kind of evolved out of um, a bunch of other kind of more meditational kind of group work I was I was doing with people. Oh, that's pretty cool. That sounds Another cool. The kind of mainstay that I've been enjoying a lot, getting a right. lot. Of right. But unfortunately, COVID, you know, probably like you mentioned, COVID's kind of stopped a lot of this uh, group work and whatnot, right? You don't want to get into a little room and scream in Hebrew with, with COVID now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and you mentioned Probably not a good idea and you're in america too that's uh you know oh yeah it's like 20 30 million cases over there you know we're i mean in Pretty korea bad. we barely we barely have that much at all here but uh oh, in yeah. america yeah, it's sort of the uh the belly of the beast so to speak right yeah yeah we've been being really careful yeah 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 all right um yeah definitely uh, i'm actually taking a class right now on the uh pgm and so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting research going on. There's all kinds of different scholars and practitioners that are really getting into it these days and sort of making a resurgence or renaissance and, you know, people experimenting with it. And um, it's sort of, it's kind of funny because it's like the new cutting edge right now, it seems like in the occult, but then it's also like the oldest, one of the oldest, uh, right. like living manuscripts or what have you, right? So yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting to see how, um, people are rediscovering it or sort of incorporating it or tying it into their um what would you want to say like renaissance practices you know golden dawn style or grimoric practices right it's sort of coming coming it's back true. around full circle in a way right it's it's been interesting because the last 10 12 13 years have been really good for um occult nonfiction, uh just just literature or uh, not literature but um uh, you know practical stuff, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and scholarly material. For a long time, uh, publishing was just, you know, occult publishing was really unfortunate. There were just a lot of books coming out that had the exact same material rehashed over and over and over again. 
right. Just a, so, not a tremendous amount of originality, you know. Right. All of a sudden, you the, yeah, you have like a thousand books with like the LBRP and like exactly, yeah, yeah. It's like there you go. That's the, <laughs> that's the whole practice. And then every once in a while, something would come out, and it would be really unique, um, and either original or just scholarly and, and useful. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, there's tons of stuff. There's all sorts of new stuff coming out. The last decade has been has been so much better. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of even going back through like the 1980s it had kind of stagnated for a really long time and mm. yeah and definitely it, in the meantime there's been a couple of different periods where people had said well we're having an occult renaissance and it's like are we really not really uh but now it feels like we, we kind of are a little bit there's there's just a lot of, um uh, more avenues of inquiry opening up yeah, I think one big thing is um, there is a, it's sort of like a merging between scholars and practitioners, right? So you have people who yeah. are practitioners, but they're also like, you know, serious scholars, right? It's not like they're just taking whatever their teacher told them and just blindly practicing it. They're actually going in and like, you know, they're looking at like Sloan manuscripts in the British library. Like people are getting right. pretty serious and that wasn't, you know, they sort of, um, uh, what would you say? They kind of took what their teacher said and accepted it as some sort of dogma. And this is just the way it is. And often based off these faulty translations or interpretations, perhaps, right? Whereas now they're like doing the work, but then also going back and you know, formulating their own um, perhaps opinions or uh, outlooks on the origins of these things, right? Yeah, the two sides have kind of come together because at one point, um, there was a reaction against what was called the armchair magicians, mm -hmm. uh, armchair occultists. Um, and, you know, it was almost kind of like a, an anti-intellectual um, kind of movement within, within the occult. Mm -hmm. And I, I can kind of see the point, and I was a little guilty of that myself, like, you know, being like, well, you know, some people don't actually practice. Uh, whereas now I kind of feel like, well, if somebody's just a scholar, that's perfectly fine. I mean, I can, I can certainly benefit from somebody's scholarly work I'm glad there are people that are just scholars because uh, their work is is useful you know, and, and beneficial. Um, but then there was kind of a, another backlash against the people that were backlashing against the armchair magicians. It, it seems like the two sides have just kind of built a lot of bridges, the more scholarly and the more practical. And, and there's a lot of people that can um, sit perfectly in both in both of those spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's the scholar... Been, the scholarly people bring their own, you know, value to the practitioners too, right? It's funny because, like you said, right. they can kind of can kind of shit on those people, but also then they're still buying their books and using them. Exactly, books. yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. It's still, if it wasn't for them, they probably wouldn't even be doing the work in the first place. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. It kind of reminds me of, uh, it's kind of a tangent, but, uh, you know, it's sort of people who are like, oh, screw capitalism and the system, but they're like writing these tweets on iPhones and, you know, <laughs> right. e eating McDonald's and Starbucks. You know, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> like your, your whole life is, you know, you're literally tweeting on a corporate pot product manufactured in, you know, whatever, some sweatshop and you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, sipping on Starbucks, right? But uh, that's besides the point. I'm curious, uh, before we move on to your writing, you mentioned that your original teachers, like for me, probably one of my, uh, one of my main areas of exploration and practice is actually Enochian. And so you mentioned oh, yeah. that your teachers were heavily into that. Is that still part of your practice or is it something that you kind of moved on from or uh, you still explore yeah. it or, you know, teach it or whatnot? It's still part of it, but not nearly as strong as you. I, yeah, at one point it was really a big part of it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm inspired by the people that taught me but um yeah it's kind of not and one of the things that happened with me there, there are certain aspects of it that still really kind of are mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things i found was that the, you know enochian is just this huge i don't even want to call it a system it's like a collection you know it's mm. it's got all these completely different areas and the different parts of it although they're all all tied together mm -hmm. the different parts of it work really differently some some aspects of it work really well in certain ways, other aspects of it, um, both in my experience and the experience of a, a number of people that I know that have worked mm. with are just kind of like, maybe we're not using them right or something. They're, they're just, mm. they don't them to flow right and, and they just seem harder to access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At one point I was like, okay, I'm gonna explore every aspect of Anoki and you possibly can. And, um, and if I just kind of got to a point where I was like, well, this is not really the area that I wanna I want to dedicate the rest of my life to and, and kind of moved on to other things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 
still use it though. There were there were still aspects of it that I found that I find tremendously uh, tremendously useful. Mm -hmm. uh, like for instance, the the Enochian aethers. Mm. Uh, knowing that I'm using the Enochian aethers absolutely wrong. Um, <laughs> oh, the way that John D used them at all. You know, I'm using them in the way that Crowley used them. Uh, right. But, um, whether that's right or wrong, it, it certainly has been incredibly effective to me. It's, it's given me a, a tremendous amount of, of value. Uh, so, yeah, I, exactly. It's kind of like whether it's, whether it's right or wrong, it's like what sort of, you know, theoretically or historically wrong or right, but uh, what sort of impact has it had on you? That's sort of more the, uh, in my opinion, I mean, of course, with the scholarly stuff, you can go back and look at like the deep purist stuff and that's also making a resurgence and, uh, yeah. A lot of people exploring that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, like, since, you know, you work with, like, the Golden Dawn um, form of Enochian, and uh, obviously it's, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be using the Aether, scrying the Aethers or um, exploring it if it didn't have some sort of, if it didn't work, right? If it didn't have actual right. practical applications or some sort of impact on you, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I, I have a friend that's uh, really explored a lot of the more, I guess you'd call them, like, the less popular I was going to call them outre, but that's not quite right. They mm -hmm. had the popular uh, aspects of the Enochian system, like less less explored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been largely like a deep purist, but has also done some of the Golden Golden Dawn work. Mm -hmm. um, and he's done some really fascinating work. He's done a lot of work with Libra Loga and, and some other mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and I remember having a conversation with him about just some of the different aspects uh, of, of the entire system and how some of them are just so hard to break into. Some of them just... It's like, you know, walking into a brick wall or something. They, they just don't want to open themselves to you. And then other aspects, just, just like a pair of open doors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I recently actually read one of your books and um, I was very, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I don't read that much fiction anymore. I used to read a lot of novels and fiction and whatnot. And these days it's mostly either occult texts or, you know, biographies or, psychology books, self-help, you know, just a wide array of nonfiction, I guess, pretty much everything nonfiction, right? <laughs> um, right? But yeah, I mean, it's been a while to read a, a fiction book, and I read your uh, Psalms of the Magistrate. That was amazing. I mean, I just, I couldn't put it down, and what I really liked about it is how you sort of interlay these occult themes or occult transcendental experiences, which many people describe as ineffable, right? But nonetheless, you're able to use sort of poetic language to kind of, I don't know what you'd say, put yourself sort of in that state or um, put, at least put the reader, kind of transmit these experiences to the reader in a certain way. But then while at the same time, you, you kind of also have a lot of this uh, very empirical, um, what would you say, like physical aspect of the writing and sensation so it, it, it doesn't only feel like this sort of you know woo woo out there sort of crazy occult stuff but you also feel like you're in the character you're in the situation you're you know you're in your five senses so to speak right so right. Um, yeah a tremendous amount of the work that i do um, with writing mm -hmm. has to do with um strategies uh mm -hmm. for of conveying these things that are really hard to put into words and really really hard to convey in any kind of straightforward way mm -hmm. um and i've come up with just you know, strategy after strategy after strategy. There's an interview that um, I did with Justin Isis where uh, it, it opens up with kind of like a little mini manifesto on occult fiction. Mm -hmm. And then most of the interview, I think, if I remember right, is, is just talking about these different strategies. And I'll tend to overlay them on each other, uh, on top of mm -hmm. each other story. And um, they, they create this kind of interlocking kind of dynamic um, that uh, where you've got multiple... Uh, things kind of going on in the text that are intended to kind of convey these ideas to the reader. Some of them a little bit more on the surface than others. Um, some of them are designed to almost not be noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not doing any kind of creepy, like trying to manipulate people unconsciously or anything like that. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I, I mean, like any, any author, and you see this film a lot where um, the filmmaker uh, wants to convey a certain impression and you know Stanley Kubrick is famous for this. Will resort to every trick that they can come up with in order to convey that impression, not to manipulate their viewers, but because uh, they just want to convey this this impression. You know, using using as many different things as possible. So I've adapted a lot of that into writing. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'll, I'll have going on in the background. A lot of structures that are hidden um, that are kind of they're very much not intended for the reader to necessarily discern. 
but they kind of um, uh, direct the flow of, of what's going on in the story. And, and a lot of the um, underlying ideas are, are tied to these kind of structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt like... Um, what is it? At some level, a reader is, is aware of it. And mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, I felt like if I read uh, that same book again and again and again, I feel like I would get a different angle or a different... Um, like you said, there's just layers and layers of what you're writing. Um, so I felt like each, you know, each later reading would reveal something different for sure. It was very deep in that regard, yeah. That's um, part of the idea too. I I'm, take a lot of inspiration from Gene Wolfe, uh, who specifically oh, okay. stories in such a way that um, it, the second time you read it, if you remember what happened the first time, you'll get a completely different idea of what's going on because, you know, there's something that happens towards the end of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, just throws everything into a different light. And then if you read it a third time, well, there's another layer beneath that. If you read it a fourth time, there's yet another layer, it just goes down. Wolf yeah. was kind of a genius at making these kind of insane crossword puzzle uh, like um, structures with his, his books. Um, and I wouldn't put myself quite, quite at the Wolf level, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I try to do kind of a similar thing where, um, yeah, there's certain mm -hmm. things and this works very differently in different stories. Some stories mm -hmm. have different than others, but um, there are certain insights that are that turn up a little bit later in the stories that cast a different light on stuff that happens earlier. And, mm -hmm. What, what uh, initially inspired you to write this sort of occult fiction? And uh, you know, like I, like we were mentioning, you sort of um, you sort of like interlay these occult experiences uh, into the writing, right? But what what kind of got you on this uh, on this path? Um, well, I'd always kind of written. Um, I used to. Write uh, surrealist kind of text and prose um, for a, a website that I used to run. Uh, but I, you know, and I used to paint, I did all this, this artistic stuff. I'd always been really artistic, but I'd never been able to tie my art forms to um, my spiritual practice. It's just always massive gulf divided them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess about a little more than 10 years ago, maybe, um, I had been scrying the Enochian Aethers and I came out of one and I got the idea for a novel just all at once, just popped in my head. Um, and I wrote it. And uh, I, at that point I hadn't developed any of the ideas that I use now. Uh, and when I got done, you know, I gave it to a couple of people and then I kind of came back to it and realized that I'd kind of accidentally written a young adult novel. Mm -hmm. And I was horrified. I was like, it's the last thing I wanted to write. <laughs> that's hilarious failure <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I thought yeah. okay well i'm obviously not a, a fiction writer that's not going to happen <laughs> i tried to write a, a few short stories and they kind of petered out mm -hmm. uh, and they were very occult so super 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 drenched in the occult but it just didn't um i feel like i learned how how not to write or what what not to write uh, what i didn't want to write by by mm -hmm. doing and um I started buying books by uh, Ex Occidente Press um, in Romania. Mm -hmm. I think they're down at Braxis. And in fact, I have a book coming out in the press pretty soon. But um, Oh, nice. Um, uh, I was collecting these books and I started reviewing them and uh, doing these kind of vaguely poetic reviews you know, on places like Goodreads and stuff. And uh, the publisher, Dan Getu, sent me an email and said, are you a writer? I think you're a writer. I want you to write me something. And I was like, what? I don't, I don't think I am. I don't know. Uh, and I, I kind of basically I tried to talk him out of the idea. Um, Interesting. And then I, I just said, okay, well, I'll try, you know, I'll see what I can do. Uh, and, uh, and I wrote the, my first published piece, which was a salamander angel. Um, and I was just really happy with it. I just came up with all sorts of ideas. Um, when, when was this, by the way, what year was this? Just out of curiosity. Uh, 2014, I think. Yeah, I think it was okay. February, 2014. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I was just really happy with the results. It was just completely different than what I thought I was I was going to write. Um, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't corny teen teen uh, it wasn't corny teen fiction like uh, like you got revealed in the Enoki. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> was it some corny romance novel? <laughs> Enoki spirits are like write this novel, and they're like cracking up. And like, you got to yeah it's uh Sucker. yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> hey, you got trolled you got trolled in the uh in the totally <laughs> Anyways, yeah, sorry. Yeah. and now they're like oh man it's actually <laughs> writing real good stuff now oh, damn it all right <laughs> uh, so i mean when i when i wrote the sentiment angel i i realized there's just a tremendous amount of places i could take this it just opened up like 10 doors all at once with this one story um 
and I just kept kept going, kept writing, and and uh, kept finding new techniques um, and finding new ways to do things. And, and meanwhile, kind of uh, hit upon the main motifs and um, kind of just kind of the things that I wanted to write about uh, that I still use to this day. Um, mm -hmm. And so far, it's it's been good. I'm still finding all sorts of new things to do, new ways to do things, new motifs, new ways to uh, completely subvert um, what I've what I've done so far. Mm -hmm. I'm curious when you, because um, like when I read uh, the uh, Psalms of the Magistrate, when when you're writing these things, I'm more I'm curious about the process actually. So like, is it like you have these experiences and you're like, oh, how can I interlay? Like you channel this almost and like you're interlaying it in the book, or is it like while you're writing the book, you realize that oh, that experience that I had here would go really good here. Does that make sense to you? The question. Oh, yeah, it's really the latter. That's it. it it's a really organic. Okay. Okay. Uh, I never know what my books are going to be about or my story is going to be about when I start them. I, I generally start out with a particular scene and a particular feeling. Okay. And, um, and I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, and then as I write, um, the they'll, uh, like all the stuff just kind of organically tends to come up. I, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how consistently this works. Mm -hmm. Like every story that I write, it's like, oh, it worked again. Wow. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know the the structure will build itself and suggest itself. And what happens is I get to a, a certain point and I have to go back and change a lot of what I had already written because um, once I kind of come up with the underlying structure and the theme and the motif and all of the strategies I want to use, um, I have to go back and make what I've written so far consistent with that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and okay. there's always a certain amount of rewriting. Mm -hmm. I, kind of at some point I decide okay this is how the story is going to end and then I almost never ended that way always ends up being totally different than I expect oh that's interesting yeah I play um I mean I'm not I don't I'm not really a writer per se but uh I've written some things but uh more of a musician that kind of reminds me of if you're like jamming with a band and you're sort of coming up with stuff on the spot you're you don't know really necessarily know what direction it's going to go but um at the end of the day sometimes you're just kind of surprised with the uh like the final product right like it's sort yeah, of like, it's like that, except I, whatnot. Yeah. I heavily whatnot. edit my jams. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> I go well, back and, a, and rewrite history. Yeah, that's the same thing. Studio like a live, like, like writing <laughs> jam. I, it would be so bad. You wouldn't even believe my unedited uh -huh. pro. I'm pretty sure I could strip paint off like iron. <laughs> really that's, funny. that's just nice about writing, right? You can just keep going mm -hmm. back and keep uh, refining and refining, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a lot of my writing process is just a, a huge process of refining. And, and even, you know, when I get to the end, um, almost always after I finish a piece and I come back to it and, and start doing like little edits and changes, uh, I'll find something in it that I had no idea was there and I'll, I'll be able to put something in it or change the direction of something slightly that just reveals, it, it makes the whole thing make so much more sense. Mm. It always tightening the drawstrings at the end, like everything kind of makes and it all ties together but it's a little bit loose and then somehow in the end I, I'll find like the one string I can pull that just like tightens everything up and um, if all goes well uh, at the end of this you know at the end of the process it's just a really tight little you know it, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like um, some I think one thing about uh, fiction that I got bored with is that me and Justin kind of talked about this where it's sort of too formulaic it's like like you read a fantasy novel and it's almost like, I don't know, it's uh, it's kind of one of the reasons that I really, I live out here in South Korea and one of the reasons I really got into Korean movies initially was um, the fact that they're just so different. Like I remember watching some of these old like Kim Ki-duk, Pak chan movies where like you're so used to this Hollywood structure, right? Where it's like this happens and then this happens and this is the happy ending, right? It's sort of right. like you can, the typical Hollywood movie, it's like, once you watch 10 minutes of it, it's almost like, you know, the ending, you know, what's going to happen in the middle. It just becomes predictable and boring, right? Whereas like, when I got into Korean movies, what I loved about them is they were just so fucked up. Like it would go in a different <laughs> direction. Like, you know, like almost every, I think like the first 10 Korean movies I watched, they had these fucking horrific endings, right? Like, <laughs> like uh, one of these is like uh, this movie called Napun Namja where, uh, this uh, this girl gets sort of um, forced into prostitution, and it, it it almost seems like it's gonna have a good ending, you know, like oh she's gonna get free and it's gonna all turn out, but no, that's not. If it was an American movie, that's how it end, right? Like she got free, right. now she's like talking for women to empower them and you know not get in this situation, but now not in a Korean movie, like 
it does not end well, <laughs> you know, let's just put it that way. So, um, you know, one thing I like about your writing um, is not, not only can I not predict where it's going to go, right? Like, it's not like a typical novel where it's so formulaic, it's so predictable, like the Hollywood movie analogy, but uh, I, I also like these little, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but these like literary techniques that you use. So one thing I liked about your particular book was um I was just reading it and it's like you're a writer writing about another writer where this guy is reviewing his writing <laughs> you know it's oh, like, right. <laughs> uh, just it reminded me of that meme like uh do you remember that exhibit meme where he's like uh he's like I'm taking a picture of a picture so I can edit the picture within the picture or something like that right right <laughs> yeah so I thought that was uh you know these little like literary uh techniques not only is like it's sort of non-linear but it's also using these um I don't know maybe I just haven't read enough but there's sort of these different um literary techniques that I haven't really seen used much of anywhere right yeah and I hope that's unique I, I haven't seen it anywhere um yeah, and that, like, so many of my other, I, so I, like, I try to, um, like, so that particular technique was used to try to elucidate a particular aspect of um, kind of initiatory work, but I, I really don't think I could find another way to really, really explain, you know, it, it's not really, um, even in itself, it's not really a rational, straightforward explanation, it's this weird kind of symbolic, almost allegorical, but not quite allegorical, um, way I have of kind of demonstrating this kind of um, initiatory kind of dynamic mm. uh, overlaid with sense. all of the stuff about the magistrate and everything. The interesting thing about that book or one of the interesting things is um, I, right after I'd finished that, uh, I was talking to Justin Isis about um, the story he was writing for, there was a, a Klaus Laufenberg anthology. Mm -hmm. What that is and why is, is almost, it's like too hard to explain, but <laughs> one of the most obscure and random ideas for an anthology ever. Um, and, I, and I totally, I, I was very happy to be in that book. Um, but I was talking to Justin about the, the thing he was doing. And so in Psalms of the Magistrate, there's sections of text where somebody's written some text and somebody else crosses things out and kind of rewrites it. Mm. Um, Justin was talking about, yeah, I just wrote the story where there's somebody that's like writing text and then somebody else crosses words out and writes something else in. And I was like, wait, what? And he hadn't read my story at that point. He had no idea. Oh, we both wow. in time had done this exact same thing. Totally different. I mean, the context in which these things exist could not be more different. Um, mm -hmm. That's funny. It, it reminds uh, me of, a, it reminds me of um, uh, what is it? Rupert Sheldrake. He talks about those morphogenic fields where like a monkey discovers how to unpeel a banana on some random island, but like unrelated you know they would never be in contact with each other like two thousand miles away like every monkey unlocks this you know this hidden skill or whatnot right this new skill so it kind of reminds right. me of that right like at the same time you guys are sort of tapping into this uh literary skill right like it, it's like uh it just got unlocked for the human species yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, i mean it totally felt like we had both hit upon the same thing and taken it yeah. to different places mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. wow I'm curious, um, where, do, where do you see occult, this sort of style of fiction, this sort of occult fiction? Uh, me and Justin kind of talked about, in his view, it was like a lot of it was sort of um, like this horror, you know, a lot of like, the, if you think of like occult fiction, like a lot of people would think about some sort of like horror, uh, kind of almost right. like corny horror pieces or something. But uh, where do you see, I mean, you're part of this movement, right? Like, where do you see this going? Do you see it developing? Do you see a lot more writers kind of jumping in or where, where do you well, see Well, that's going? kind of the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's partly, I'm doing it out of a massive dissatisfaction with existing occult fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, occult fiction as horror never made sense to me. Um, there's nothing horrific to me about occultism. Um, mm -hmm. not, I mean, there's not, not that isn't horrific about anything else. I mean, you know, if you make like bicycling fiction, I guess you could write horrific stuff about bicycling and these horrible accidents people would get in, but it doesn't really capture the spirit of bicycling. Um, <laughs> so I've never been able to, to relate to occult fiction as horror. Uh, and then the other side of that is um, uh, a lot of people treat it as, as kind of a way to do a kind of massive info dump and will write occult fiction that kind of sounds like a, that reads like a Wikipedia entry. Yeah. Some of my earlier stuff is a little bit guilty of that in some ways. You see a little bit of that in The Salamander Angel. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of other stuff, hopefully, in there, too. But I, I kind of moved away from that. And um, 
but there's so much that occult fiction can be that I, I just don't feel like anybody's ever really explored. Um, like my ideal in a, in a perfect world, um, my work would inspire, you know, this whole occult fiction movement and, and people would start doing all this really, really new and, and different stuff with it and taking it to places that's never been taken. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't really expect that to happen realistically. Like, I, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the hundred or so people that read my work, you know, some of them will be like, cool. And other ones will be like, screw that guy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just don't, I think it would be a little bit naive to expect to have this like major impact. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like to not try to spawn this whole kind of, you know, um, inspire this whole kind of movement of the cult fiction would be a weird kind of sin, um, almost. You know, like I, I would be, I would be short shorting myself in a way if I didn't try, even though I don't really expect it to work. Right, uh, right, right. But uh, there is, there is the uh, a lot of innovation in um, small press fiction uh, in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of it is a cult. Some of it has a cult element. Some of it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel kind of lucky to have kind of fallen in with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin's work. One of the things that I, I would really like to see with the cult fiction is I'd like to see something that's kind of similar to the, um, the, the new wave of science fiction that happened in like between the 1950s and 1970s. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of Justin that, that kind of pointed me to, to that as a possibility in the first place. And um, with Justin's work, I feel like he's kind of single-handedly created like a new, new science fiction or a new, 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 he's like created like a third wave of science fiction. If the second wave of science fiction uh, it might be like cyberpunk. Stuff that mm -hmm. happened in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, but with some of his writing, he's he's taken science fiction to places that it, I don't think have ever ever been explored. Um, and so I, that almost seems more realistic. Like I could see a third wave of science fiction arising from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've even got some ideas for like, well, I could make some occult science fiction stuff. It would be like, you know, part of the film. Yeah. That'd be trippy. Occult, <laughs> kind, of, kind of merge the two, yeah. <laughs> I've got some ideas. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see the same thing applied to a cult fiction. I, um, uh, like I, I talked about the interview that I did with Justin a while ago in which I kind of, I kind of opened it up with a little mini, mini manifesto. Uh, and I just kind of talked about a lot of things that I, I would really love to see happen with the cult fiction. I'd love to see it become more playful. Mm -hmm. Um, like why can't we have a cult fiction that's like, uh, inspired by people like Woody Allen? Mm -hmm. well, there you go. <laughs> but not so much the personal life of Woody Allen. I mean, that could be interesting right. too. But, uh, I don't think I'm going to go there, but um, <laughs> sex comedy, occult fiction. I mean, it, there's so many places it could be taken. Uh, and one of the things that I try to do is um, write occult fiction that's uh, very much inspired by authors that would never be uh, associated with, with occultism. People like Colette and Robert Walser, mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy Parker, you know, the, the list is just endless. Um, and well, uh, your, 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 your writing made me laugh, though, too. It wasn't like it was comedy writing good. or anything, but um, there, there are certain aspects of it. I don't know if it's like relatability or just um, uh, the emotions that it evoked, but definitely parts of your writing made me laugh as well, you know? Um, uh, that's good to know. I do put a lot of humor in it, and I think, yeah. I think a lot of people maybe don't get it. I've, I've heard people say that there's no humor in my writing, and I'm like, wait, really? Oh, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's actually supposed to be funny. It's not unintentional humor. Right, 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 right. It's not as overt in, in, in certain aspects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. are stories where it is a little more, but... Um, mm, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can say that. I think it's cool that you are sort of, like you said, maybe you don't expect this sort of movement of, um, uh, like, the neo-decadence movement, right? Like, sort of this mm -hmm. new um, wave of, like, whatever, different different artistic pursuits and different ways of approaching writing or whatnot. Might, might not expect it to catch on and be this huge, you know, global, like, uh, like it overtakes, you know, or it just becomes so big. Right. That there's like all these people coming out and writing books, but nonetheless, it's, I think the main thing is like just sort of um, at least attempting to do it, right? Like just looking at the current yeah. situation and with a sort of dissatisfaction and wh why not, you know, start something that might catch on. And even if not, you know, at least you did something, right? At least you, uh, right, you have an obligation to try. And, and, you know, the worst case yeah. scenario is uh, a handful of people care. Mm -hmm. And if that's the worst case scenario, I mean, that's good enough for me. You know, it's, it's, that's the worst thing. I, I would rather maybe 
a little bit get a little bit more than that but um mm -hmm. i've kind of you know with my own writing i've i've kind of come to the point in a way i kind of started out at this point where um i thought okay well how many people have to be reading my work in order for it to be worth writing because if nobody's reading it it's like the, what would be the point mm -hmm. um, and it's i've kind of come to the conclusion that yeah just a really small amount of people um that actual number kind of fluctuates but you know, not, not that many people are really needed to make it worth doing. And as long as it's worth doing, then it's worth doing. It's also worth trying to get it out to more people and, you know, um, mm -hmm. expand the audience a little bit and, and uh, in the hope of maybe inspiring some people. I mean, it's also just the, the hope of getting it into the hands of people that would like it um, currently. Yeah, don't. exactly. So like certain, like your writing, I feel like it would resonate with a lot of people. Um, and, you know, putting out art, it will attract it's sort of sort of finding the people that um, that would be interested in it anyways, right? To a degree, but uh, yeah. a lot of it is like marketing at the same time, right? Like, how do you get? I mean, you can make, for example, I can sit here in my room and I can write maybe what could be one of the greatest songs of all time, right? But if nobody mm -hmm. ever hears it, it's like that's also part of it. It's like how do you get it out there? How do you transmit the message, so to speak, right? So. I think that's a big yeah. part of it. Like, you know, I mean, I mean, that's something I'm not good at at all either. I, I know nothing about marketing. Um, I, 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 I'll, you know, that's I'm kind a, of mm -hmm. that's oh, been I'm my, limping. Oh, that's been my experience is like a lot of the best, um, whatever, writers or musicians or um, whatever, painters, artists, a lot of the best ones I've ever seen, it's like no one knows about them. It's just because that because the whole marketing or the whole um getting the art out there that's a whole nother skill in itself it's a completely separate skill set you know in my yeah opinion. yeah it totally is yeah 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 so and there's parts of it that are really ob objectionable there's there are things that i don't want to do um right I, i've heard people talk about the whole schmoozing angle and it's like oh I'm, that's just not the way that i want to go mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah, probably I... limits me all over the place although I, I don't know that i would necessarily be good at it in any case but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that a lot of artists are sort of anti, uh, what would you say, anti-marketing or it, it's sort of like the, some some of the fundamental things behind it are against their ethics or morals. So um, 10 a.m. Right. So that kind of, in a way, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of also keeps it more obscure in a way too, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I think yeah. that, I think if you use marketing in the right way, right, like going through the right channels or there, there's a way to do it where you're spreading the word of something, but also still in line with your own um, personal ethics or personal um, morals and whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So far, it's just been, you know, mostly word of mouth, and that's been getting more people. So, mm -hmm. so but that's that's fine. So what what is the uh, you're part of this uh, neo decadence movement, and it includes a lot of different um, art forms, and so it's like an art movement, basically, right? Uh, kind of, yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I feel like everybody in it has a slightly different idea of what it is and what it means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's good. I think mean, it's probably true of a lot of, of uh, past art movements as well. Mm, for sure, for sure. And there's this uh, new book coming out. I uh, recently saw a um, uh, post about it and some pictures and stuff, and I'm definitely going to pick it up. It's called, I believe it's called The Twelve Manifestos. What's the title of it? Uh, Twelve Manifestos, yeah. Yeah, I I yeah. Well, I don't remember what it is exactly, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's like twelve, it's like fifteen. Uh -huh. There's more than twelve manifestos in it. There's something like fifteen or seventeen. I don't remember exactly. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So you get uh, you get the twelve manifestos, but you get you know, here's a little marketing at there's four. bonus manifestos. <laughs> yeah, but that's not all, folks. For three easy payments <laughs> of nine ninety nine, you get four bonus manifestos. Added. Right. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So what what's the story behind this? Like, it's a different. So each, you know, there are different sort of manifestos, like you mentioned, there's maybe 16 or something in there, but are they all on different topics or different art forms or whatnot? Yeah, they're different topics. Um, there's two general uh, neo-decadent manifestos, um, which are the two founding manifestos. And then there's just a bunch. There's like the, I, I have a neo-decadent occult manifesto. Hmm. Um, and then I, I also co-wrote with Gaurav Manga uh, and I think LV, LC von Hessen. Mm -hmm pronouncing her name right, um, the uh, Neo-Decadent Architecture Manifesto, and there, there's a few other ones. Uh, and then there's like the Neo-Decadent Manif Neo Manifesto of a men's fiction and, or a men's fashion and women's fashion. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's an electronic gaming manifesto and just a number of them. 
Oh, that sounds amazing. What's what sort of inspired? Is it is it uh, what, what would you say inspired this specific uh, volume? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Justin would be able to speak to that way more than I would. Um, mm. Yeah, I can I can really only kind of speak for my part of it. Um, okay. mm -hmm. But uh, but neo decadence kind of goes back. You know, um, I don't I don't really know if it was Justin Isis or Brendan Connell that first coined the term. Mm -hmm. Um, but at one point I, they decided to kind of go ahead with it and, um, kind of turn it into more of a thing. Um, and, uh, they created a, uh, anthology, a neo-decadent anthology. Uh, and that was kind of how I got involved with, um, with Snuggly Books. Uh, I, I had an entry mm -hmm. in the, I basically contacted Justin and begged him to let me submit to the anthology. Um, <laughs> okay. I asked him if it would be uncouth if I begged. Um, <laughs> no, no, oh. do it. No, he said, he's like, get on your knees, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> Not supposed to talk about that in public. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Please. Yeah, this is, yeah, really. This sounds really interesting, though. Um, I, li I like the concept of it, like the overall concept of having these different manifestos and different, like you mentioned, fashion or occultism or um, uh, writing and whatnot. I think it's, it's sort of like a, uh, I don't know, the way that I, at least I read like the little, um, like summary of it or whatnot but it's uh, it's almost like a disruption in the system or something like that it's good it's kind of like the GameStop. you know what's going on with like GameStop? how they're just smoking these heads oh yeah right <laughs> it, it, you know it's like throwing a wrench in the system or something like that like, that's kind of how um that's kind of how this feels in a way it's sort of like no this fiction like what's coming out sucks we're gonna throw a wrench in the system and sort of disrupt it and you know it's, it's kind of supposed like... to be like a bomb yeah it's like a, like an <laughs> device yeah yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, more than anything, it's really the other side of it that I, I think is uh, is really, which is the, um, not so much the, you know, like, like saying what sucks, but inspiring mm -hmm. stuff, uh, inspiring oh, sure. or avenues that haven't been explored. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking for my part, I mean, the occult manifesto, you know, like, if anybody tried to actually follow the directions of the occult manifesto exactly, they'd be dead, they, you know, they mm -hmm. open up a temple in Chernobyl or anything like that. Probably could, but it will. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a certain amount of um, uh, just kind of taking the piss in that one. But at the same time, there's also, I think, a lot of uh, what I would consider legitimate criticism um, of the modern occult scene and a lot of kind of uh, ideas as to where it could be taken and what could be done. Um, and part of the fun is, I think, you never really necessarily know what part of it is which. Um, mm. Any given sentence can have, you know, can go back and forth between any one of those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you I think, think legitimate, you know, like uh, um, observation on how one might relate with the, the divine or the absolute mm -hmm, mm -hmm. part of it is, is something totally different. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm definitely going to pick the book up and read it. Um, what, what do you think uh, are some, so, so we kind of talked about earlier, like there's like a lot of dogmatism and uh, what, what would you say sort of you know this like lineage crap and drama and uh you know people arguing about different models or right like the spirit model versus the psychological or whatnot like what do you what do you think are what, what do you see holding back the, you know occultism in in this current uh, era there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of arbitrarily been accepted um mm -hmm. and it's been in place for so long that people just don't even think about it um the one person that is like the encyclopedia of uh, criticism of occultism over the last last hundred years mm -hmm. uh, is Jake Stratton Kent. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. Man, he like he is he's he's on it, and uh, I don't I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says, although I do agree with a lot of it. And and even where I don't agree, I find it um, it really comes from an interesting place, and it's worth exploring and following up and and really thinking about. Um, but. Uh, you know, a lot of his criticisms echo a lot of mine. I've long had a lot of criticism for the Golden Dawn, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Dawn right now is like one of the least popular forms of occultism you could possibly be into. It's mm -hmm. a, like, loves to bash the Golden Dawn now. And, you know, for good reason, kind of. Like, mm -hmm. I don't agree with a lot of what people... I have a friend who um, uh, is fond of saying that uh, Golden Dawn Lodge magic is like the prog rock of occultism. Uh, <laughs> got a point there. It kind of is. And you know, I'm not even really that into that kind of logic magic, although I do uh, do the Golden Dawn initiations with people when I when I bring them through the work. And it is kind of like 
<laughs> it's like everybody waves wands around and dresses up in these robes and stuff. Um, there are pictures from some of the big name Golden Dawn groups where they're dressed up it, like it just looks weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. not a bad thing. I mean, they almost look neo decadent. If you took it out of context, you'd be like, "Wow, well, that's neat." Yeah, <laughs> it looks like they're way more out there than they actually are. Um, right, right, but, uh, right. One of my big criticisms with the Golden Dawn in particular is that um, I guess one of my, I, you know, I talked to some of it earlier, but the system, the system ends very early. It doesn't extend very far. Um, mm -hmm. You can master everything in the Golden Dawn corpus, and you really haven't gone tremendously far. Um, mm -hmm. the system kind of froze at a certain point. They never really developed it past the uh, five equals six, the Adeptus minor level. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few people that have taken that particular system and pushed it a little bit further. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, married it with uh, Eastern mysticism and Thelema. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that his order, the AA, or one of his orders. Mm -hmm. And that, that took it to a different place. And a few other people have done the same thing. Um, I've tried to push it a little bit further. But even with me, I, I've ended up going into whole different areas in order to advance. Um, and uh, yeah, it's weird. It, it's a weird system, to, a weird thing to kind of freeze the system and say, okay, this is the whole thing. Um, right. Because you really, like I said, it just, and you, you get to a certain point after you've been working for however many years, you know, and, and you're like, yeah, where do I go now? I've done everything in every, every Golden Dawn book, you know, mastered all the techniques. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Jake Strand can. He's sort of uh, what would you say? Sort of flip the table on its head or something, right? Like right. when you read when you read like Geo Sophia, it's sort of like like you said, like all the assumptions of how you know a lot of these practices begun and what have you. Uh, he sort of just throws it. You know, it's like a big curveball, right? Like he goes into like a right. lot of those, this origin. One of his biggest contributions, I think, is pointing out how much of it, uh, how much of modern esotericism. Um, seems to be derived from Platonism, and people still really hold to to Platonic ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, is Platonism, but really, it has its roots in something much older. That's that's pre-Plato, and um, mm -hmm. which is a completely different model of uh, different way of looking at the world. And if you kind of de-Platonize occultism, you know, mm -hmm. you you can take it to a lot of places that uh, people just haven't, because in in certain circles anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I have sure. a lot of. Um, a lot of kind of criticism of Thelema as well. I, I've always had kind of a love-hate relationship with Thelema. <laughs> um, a, a lot of my criticism kind of stems from, um, let's see, how do, I, how do I put it? You know, a lot of, if you take everything Crowley said out of Thelema mm -hmm. and just to the Book of the Law and the Holy Books, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting where you can take those ideas if you don't accept necessarily Crowley's interpretation of them. Uh, and I'm not saying well, his interpretation of them is wrong or anything like that. It's just another place to take them. And it's just, um, I feel like a, a lot of people have read certain writings by Crowley and, and kind of um, calcified the idea of what, what the idea, what, uh, what's in some of those books means and, and can be and, and uh, kind of what it's all about. Right, right, when right. When you have an order, you know, anytime you solidify something in an order or a church or anything like that, uh, a set of principles, it's eventually, I mean, very quickly going to calcify. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, oh, for sure, for sure. It's sort of, um, it's like this guy comes along and with a sort of revolutionary critique of, the, you know, the, the cult of the dying gods and all, you know, sort of new aeon philosophy or what have you, or way of looking at things paradigm. But then, but then what happens is they do the same thing with him, right? Like, oh, he's the prophet. And, uh, you know, it just becomes right. a caricature of itself or the, uh sort of the it becomes what it was a critique of or something does that make sense yeah i think that's it i think that um you know a lot of things throughout the history of occultism and spirituality are inspired by something that's extremely genuine mm -hmm. uh, that one could say has an eternal aspect uh, to it and it gets expressed and kind of manifest in this kind of you know within the temporal and um gets subject to all the limitations of the temporal world uh, I kind of think that the uh, the manifested world is really a place of limitation and decay. I mean, that's its ultimate nature. Mm -hmm. The only way to keep something fresh is to constantly renew it. Uh, and the only way that can happen is if um, there's kind of constant revolution, constant destruction. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the history of any religion um, is the history of, of corruption. Uh, even right. in Buddhism, well, Buddhism is not like that. It's all about peace and love and it's... It's not really true, you know. There's a lot of corruption in Buddhism as well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a lot of modern, especially mainstream Buddhism is, is calcified in the same way that a lot of other mainstream religions have. Mm. You just, but it's just going to happen. I, I think, um, um, you know, yeah, con constant revolution, constantly blowing things up, I think is the only real way to, to go forward. And, you know, you, you have to, at the same time, allow some things to take form, knowing that it's not going to last forever. Because if you're, if you're really blowing things up all the time, then you, that kind of dooms you as well. You know, you never get anything off the ground, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I for sure. I think these eternal ideas are really meant to uh, persist in, um, uh, in time so much. It, it's, it's interesting when things go underground for a long time and then they resur they have a resurgence many years later. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way in which older ideas can kind of have fresh takes uh, applied to them and, and still yield thing, something new and relevant. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's a good point to sort of reevaluate um, what what it was originally or whatnot, right? Yeah, definitely. Right. I, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, it's cool. I'm definitely looking forward to reading your um, uh, manifesto in there as well about cultism and just uh, it, it does fascinate me with people who sort of question the because it's like you have a cultism that's sort of like out there in a way that it's not you know, obviously it's not like a mainstream, it's, it's called occultism, it's not called mainstream, you know, right. society or whatnot, and then you have like, it's supposed to be hidden. Yeah, exactly, and then you have people like Jake or other people like you who are like, you know, just questioning the fundamental assumptions or principles of a hidden philosophy, if that makes sense, like you said, like Neoplatonism, like questioning that, you know, a lot of people don't even think like they get into occultism and they don't even question maybe perhaps the fundamental you know, assumptions that these, these certain things are coming from, right? Like Neoplatonism or emanationism yeah. or whatnot, right? Exactly. And, and I mean, a lot of the older ideas, when you go back to them, um, every bit as radical as brand new ideas, because they're, we're, the context that we're living in now mm -hmm. uh, include them so much. It does, mm -hmm. but in, in a very underground, unseen way, um, they have, they have an influence, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how can uh, people find your work? Like, do you have a website up or, you know, I, f I found some of your books on Amazon, but are there um, other publishing websites or do you have, do you run your own website that you sell um, books on as well? Uh, I run a website, but I don't really sell anything on it. It's um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's a total mouthful. Galganuza is a, a city mm -hmm. uh, created by William Blake. Um, oh, wow. And uh, Golganusamancy would be like divination by way of this William Blake created city. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you, yeah, you can look on Amazon. You can, Goodreads is a good place to start. That uh, there you can find everything that I've ever published. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've published is, is way out of print. Uh, especially in the early years, I published a lot of books uh, on limited edition um, small presses that put out these really beautiful and ornate um, hardcover books, but there's only like, you know, a hundred of them and okay. they sell fast. And if you can find them now, they're super, super expensive. Mm. Um, my goal is to reprint everything in paperback and eventually make it all, um, available. Uh, so far the way I'm working out is I tend to write faster than I can reprint. Um, mm. so my backlog of unavailable work just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. Um, but as I go along, I am finding, you know, I, I am reprinting it. I, I, there's another book coming out on Snuggly that, uh, well, we print some of the um, out of print material and uh, combine that with some new material as well. Okay. Uh, we print something that's out of print. I want to. I want to also have something new at it so that people who've read the old stuff have a reason to buy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm also curious. Where would you recommend? Because um, I've only read one of your books so far. I really enjoyed it, and I'm planning to uh, to dig into some of your other books. Uh, I even asked you like. Uh, I asked you like, oh, which book should I read first, or what book do you recommend? Because I was I was gonna go through that Psalms of the Magistrate, and I think I was gonna read one of yours called um, was it uh, Daughters of Apostasy? Was that the name? Oh, Daughters of Apostasy. Yeah, it's the, the yeah. first book that you put out. Okay, okay. So like, say somebody is, uh, you know, they listen to this interview and they're like, wow, these books sound fascinating. This sounds right up my alley. Where would you, is there like even a place you would recommend to start or just, you know, sort of randomly choose one or what would you say? Uh, yeah, I, I would kind of recommend my latest paperback, um, which is mm -hmm. the Asymptotic Imperial. Um, it's a novel. It's out on Snuggly Books. Um, that one I just feel is really typical of my writing. I feel like if you don't like that, you're probably not going to like anything that I write. <laughs> okay. And you'll probably like most of the stuff that I write. Um, 
And uh, Daughters, in a, Daughters of Apostasy and Star of Nosea collect my earliest published work, uh, but they also have some new stuff. Uh, the, the last uh, novella in each of those books is um, more recent. Mm -hmm. um, and that stuff, I still stand by all of that stuff, but I'm just a little bit more distanced from it. Um, so I'm a little bit, I, I'm always most, you know, the most excited about the most recent material. Um, because the further you get from something that you create, you know, the more you can see all, everything that's wrong with it, basically. Um, I'm sure my new stuff has wrong, you know, things wrong with it as well, but I can't see it yet. So, right, right, right. Yeah. I have the illusion that it's better or something. But yeah, the Incephalic Imperial, I think, is pretty much the perfect place to start. It's also, it's, it's, it's you know, it's just a novella. So uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to drop a bunch of money on it to get it. Um, easily available through like Amazon and bookshop.org and a ton of other online retail sites. You can also order directly from the Snuggly Books site. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. If you want to drop a lot more money, um, I I always advertise my books as they come out on the Galga Newsomancy site. Okay. Um, I can I'll, I can I can send you a message with that link in it uh, if you want to post it up with the uh, with the interview or something because it's it's going to be really hard for people to get from just my saying it. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'll have uh, I'll have all the links uh, to your website and to you know the publishers and to Amazon and stuff in the show notes as well. Um, you don't you don't release or do you release uh ebooks as well do you do you, is that a thing uh, i just had one come out um the daughters of apostasy book has an ebook okay uh, okay that's there so far i have a feeling snuggly will probably um make ebooks out of the other ones as well mm -hmm. i think that's an interesting thing too it's like i'm very curious from a writer's perspective like um is, is ebook sort of like is that like blasphemous and do you feel like that's sort of um uh like it doesn't do justice like you should have a physical book or do you think it's just the modern age like putting ebooks e out is just practical and gets your um writing out to a bigger audience what's your view on that uh, i don't have any problem with it at all i'm, I'm totally mm -hmm. fine with it I, I rarely read them because i just love to uh, well i know that when when you read a book you know the um the physical book is going to have some association um that stays with you it's, it's more of a tactility to it mm -hmm. On the other hand, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to have people read my books as ebooks. I don't really, um, it doesn't really bother me much. Mm -hmm. Ebooks, okay. whatever you have, any way I could possibly have to uh, to get them to people who are interested and want to read them. Oh, for sure, for sure. Especially people like me <laughs> over here in uh, Korea, where uh, you know you order something from the states and it takes like a month or something or two weeks. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, and you're like, all right, I can just click right now and buy it, and I'm, I'm reading it within ten seconds. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, people, especially that. that live in places that where it's especially incredibly expensive to order stuff, yeah, uh, I, I'm just I tend to just give PDFs to people like that, and especially um, to work that I have that's out of print. If I if I have something that's like a couple of years out of print, and it's probably not going to be reprinted for a while, mm -hmm. um, there's no reason to let that stuff just languish. I mean, if somebody wants to read it and there's no way they can get it, and they can't get my other work because it costs you know fifty bucks to ship it or eighty or something. Mm -hmm. I'm always happy to send a PDF or two. Oh, for sure, for sure. All right, well, uh, I'll put uh, links to your site and uh, your books in the show notes. And uh, yeah, looking forward to reading more of your writing. And uh, when is the uh, the Twelve Manifestos in Neo Decadence? It's out this week or next week? I think it's out pretty soon, right? Yeah, I think it is this week. Um, mm -hmm. I have a whole other book coming out on Mount Abraxas. Uh, it's called the Narcissus Variations. Okay. Uh, when is that up? Uh, that one is maybe now. Uh, I just <laughs> posted pictures of it from it's back from the printer, so oh, uh, nice. I think it's just coming out now. Um, yeah, it can be ordered. If um, there's not really an order link, you have to either get in touch with the publisher or go through Zeising Books to get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely more expensive. It's a, it's a limited edition hardcover. Mm -hmm. um, it's based in. Um, it was actually written for a Kibbo Kift anthology. Mm -hmm. uh, may or may not still happen, but it, it turned out to be too long to fit in the anthology. Um, so the Kibbo Kift is this kind of obscure, vaguely occult, um, pseudo Boy Scout order. Uh, <laughs> to inspire like the Woodcraft, which is also like an occult Boy Scout order that like Victor Neuberg was, was involved in. Interesting. It's the most obscure thing in the world to have an anthology on, um, save for maybe Klaus Laufenberg. Um, and so when, when I heard that, yeah, there's going to be this Kibble Kift anthology, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I totally want to be part of it. Oh, um, but cool. it's coming out as its own book. So um, 
Uh, it, it fortunately it works without the context of, of knowing who the Kibbutz is. And, um, so yeah, there's that, and then yeah, the Twelve Manifestos. Yeah, I think that's out this week. You can get that through Snuggly Books. Okay, nice, nice. All right, well, uh, yeah, definitely going to link this up. And um, yeah, I really had a nice time on this interview. And yeah, any anytime, maybe in the future, if you have uh, any more books coming out or um, whatnot, definitely I'm happy to link them up. Uh, I have a little Facebook group, and um, maybe in the future do another round two podcast. That'd be fun too. Yeah, yeah, get a hold of me. I'm I'm totally down. Okay, cool. All right. And uh, until next time.